Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we will be continuing to read Out of the Shadows, Reimagining Gay Men's Lives by Walt Odets. We will be starting Chapter 7, Gay Men's Relationships. When the road was put through two kings by their embellishments, for example, a veneer of blue enameled bricks invested it with a splendor which made it the wonder of their world. Keith Waldrop, The Not Forever. A human society is not a thing. It is a group of people living in more or less tight proximity with a tradition and thus a collection of explicit rules and unspoken expectations. Sanctioned formal institutions, social stigmatization, and the long arm of the law attempt to enforce these norms. Those who are willing to comply are enticed by a host of benefits including a common language, riches, a fire department, and weekly garbage pickup. Those who are not willing are deprived, marginalized, and punished. With the Constitution and the Bill of Rights presumably underpinning American society, we might expect an acceptance of diversity and true equality, but we would be dreaming. For a land almost entirely populated by immigrants, America is conspicuously intolerant of real diversity, racial and otherwise, and that intolerance is burrowed deeply into the emotionally intimate lives of its citizens. Human beings, with the probably unique capacity to self-consciously fear their own dreams, desires, and impulses, live in perpetual anxiety about human emotional life, and thus society unraveling into chaos. This is one important reason that America has an appointed committee of nine black-robed justices who ultimately decide who can be in love with whom and how that love may be expressed. Such social and judicial attempts at regulation too often crush the potential richness of human life and have left too many gay people living not as themselves, but as social mimics or as recluses who have made the fears of others their own. A full century after the Emancipation Proclamation and the end of the American Civil War, Interracial marriage, miscegenation, was still illegal in many American states. In 1967, the Supreme Court struck down anti-miscegenation laws, which changed the official rules, but not the feelings of a probable majority of fearful and thus hateful Americans. It took another half century for the Black Robed Committee to strike down laws prohibiting gay marriage, which has also changed the rules, but not on the whole, societal feelings. What is most astonishing about these two long-standing social conflicts is that American society ever meddled at all in such personal matters of feeling. And it has been not only the law, but also societal stigmatization and shaming that have driven the meddling, meddling that has left deep, disfiguring emotional wounds, passed on from one generation to the next. African Americans and gay people are still attempting to heal these wounds. The Hope Society continues to offer the socially constructed idea of marriage, which is the same, often humanly unrealistic, relationship it has always been, now slightly modified by a larger potential population of participants. This traditional, socially constructed idea of a relationship is granted social status with family celebration, legal rights and protections, and financial incentives. But actively or by default, society prohibits such benefits for relationships not socially constructed and treats many as if they did not exist. For prohibited or ignored emotionally constructed relationships, the important substance of the relationship the bonding, companionship, love, trust, and intimacy is dismissed by a society that fears diversity and the social disorganization it seems to threaten. Emotionally constructed relationships are instinctual and central in human life. Everyone has a relationship, has lost a relationship, or has simply longed for one. Whatever the experience, have, had, or longed for, our internal lives are inextricably woven around how we relate to others emotionally. As adolescents approaching adulthood, the prospect of a relationship fills us with aspiration and longing. If only there were someone I could love, 
a gay 17 year old once said to me, I would feel okay. Having found another young man with whom he experienced six months of elation, he later said, I could be wrong, but I think the whole relationship thing is overrated. It's much more complicated than I thought. Relationships are indeed complicated. The 17 year old had not lost his hope, but he had realized that for gay men, the complications are usually even greater. As a group, gay men quite naturally crave both socially constructed and emotionally constructed relationships. Everyone craves social acceptance to some degree and all people, even men, instinctually crave companionship, love and emotional intimacy. These two cravings for acceptance and love are inborn and are reinforced by the dependency and vulnerability experienced in infancy and childhood. In the adolescent aspirations and adult lives of gay men, both cravings are strong but often difficult to distinguish. Many intuitively feel that what they crave emotionally can only be had within socially constructed relationships. Serious and meaningful relationships have long been defined by conventional heterosexual marriage, which is the only model for relationships that many know. In reality, most relationships between two men are emotionally constructed, personally conceived inventions. As a group, gay men have been remarkably successful at relationships that work, which is, in the face of pervasive social expectation, wonderful evidence for the occasional triumph of the human spirit over fearful social meddling. For the heterosexual who wonders which man in the gay couple is the wife, the useful answer is probably, you are ignorant of the emotional complexity and potential richness of human life. We're trying to dig out from under your mess and find and be ourselves. Because of the assumed authority of conventional relationship models, gay men, young and old, often feel that relationships are, for them, out of reach. Although they are not alone in these feelings, gay men seem to approach the prospect with an unusual amount of both aspiration and doubt. Gay men are not alone in using longevity as the marker of success, with little attention to the actual human experience of the couple. For many, the existence of long-term gay relationships is evidence for the viability of relationships between men. In themselves, gay relationships are no more unavailable or problematic than any other relationships. The gay relationships must persevere in a society that is, still today, largely obstructive. The major obstruction is the imposition of heterosexual relationship models, which are too often cited to assert the idea that gay men without them die alone and lonely. I have heard this cliché repeatedly, once as a personal warning to me at the age of 22 from an eminent usually insightful psychoanalyst and family friend. The implicit message was that without a conventional heterosexual relationship, meaning without being heterosexual, I would have no relationship. The truth is that within relationships, many people, gay and straight, both live and die alone and lonely. In this unhappy human dilemma, Gay men symptoms fare better than others because of the broader possibilities that relatively convention-free gay relationships allow. These possibilities include the nurture of a second family of choice, which does not rely on the often contentious, fickle nature of biological families. In 2018, American society still teems with ill will for gay people, marriage or no marriage, and even without ill will, there is a great deal of well-meant but misplaced doubt about gay relationships. Recently back from 2015 Family Thanksgiving in Texas, a sensitive and perceptive 26-year-old gay therapy patient, Tom, related a brief conversation he had had with his mother. I know that your Republican friends don't want me to be gay, he said to her. But what do you and dad have against me? His mother's probably well-intentioned response was, Men don't have relationships, and your father and I just want you to be happy. Such warnings, which are significantly evolved from the idea of the homosexual and from utterly unfounded confidence in conventional relationships, 
have predictable consequences. They tend to fulfill their own predictions. Dismissing, stigmatizing, or prohibiting gay relationships, society will then use the result of those influences to demonstrate that gay relationships do not work or do not even exist in any substantive human emotional sense. Tom returned from the family visit with his determination to live as a gay man intact. He also still carried hope for a relationship, but the hope lived in a shadow of fear that his mother might be right. I am sometimes afraid, Tom said, that I will never find someone to be with. I don't think I know how to do that. I don't know if it's possible. I know we can't, and I'm not asking you to, but I suddenly had the feeling that I wanted you to hug me. I feel very lonely, and I'm scared. You'll find someone, I glibly promised. How can you know that? Tom asked me with irritation. You're right, I apologize. I can't know that. I think I was trying to avoid the pain and fear you're obviously feeling. I think I was simply avoiding it because it's painful for me to see you feeling this way. But I know you, and I think it's possible, and it's something we have to try to work on. The Hopelessness, the story of Michael. Some sense of hopelessness about relationships is experienced by all but the rosiest of people. But among gay men, hopelessness is more frequently articulated than it is among heterosexual men. It is more likely to be about the very possibility of a relationship rather than its quality. And it is a feeling much more likely to have been first experienced during developmentally formative adolescent years. The imbalance of hopelessness between gay and straight men is perhaps clarified by the suggestions of a disturbing piece of research from 2011. In the United States, only about 60% of men who have had sex with men self-identify as gay. The 40% who are not gay identified are almost certainly not even entertaining the idea of a relationship with another man. They are having sex, and as the homosexual model dictates, sex has no meaning beyond the physical act. For men who are gay identified and have had thoughts of relationships, my social experience and 30 years as a psychotherapist suggest considerable hopelessness even in the age of internet dating and legally approved gay marriage. I began working with Michael in 2012, after his 38th birthday had instigated his decision to see someone to talk to. Michael lived alone in a spacious flat in San Francisco's Coal Valley, was a published novelist, and had both a public following and a robust private social life. I am embarrassed, ashamed really, to even tell you why I'm here, Michael said as he sat down in his chair on our first meeting. We don't have to talk about it right now. Perhaps you can tell me something else about yourself and your life. And at some point when you're more comfortable, we'll come back to it. It's that I've never had a relationship and I just turned 38. I believe that you'll have nothing but contempt for that. I have nothing but contempt for myself. It seems like a terrible failure, an inadequacy within me that I will never be able to correct. When I was 18 and at Brown, I met someone named Paul who told me he was gay and we started having sex, which continued for most of the school year. I didn't even think of myself as gay. Don't ask me how I reconciled that because I have no idea. I suppose it was all unconscious. I was much more into him than I acknowledged. I spent that first summer between terms in England, and I received a letter from Paul ending it. He said, this isn't going to work for me. Those were his words. I was bereft and suicidal for the next seven weeks and waiting for my return flight home. I was planning to jump off the Dover cliffs. 19 years old, not gay, and suicidal over another boy. I was living with a family in Dover and I'd walk to the cliffs, a stretch with no fence, and sit, day after day, looking at the channel. One day, about three weeks after I got in the letter, a sweet, rather decrepit elderly couple walked by, and the old woman looked at me and said, Love, don't sit so near the edge. I can't tell you why, but at that moment, I started to cry. 
and I gave up on the idea of jumping. I've dabbled with other guys since Paul, here and there, for a short time, and nothing has worked out. It's all come to naught. It's a failure I'm very ashamed of. There's a lot to talk about here, but what do you think about how the old woman affected you? Michael thought about it for a minute. I think she made me feel that she cared, that someone loved me. Michael tried to restrain himself, but he started sobbing. Beneath his apparent career and social success lingered a hopelessness that described both his past and future. Michael's history of self-professed failure felt, to him, like proof of his future. He once told me that the only future he could seriously fantasize was one of complete, uninterrupted solitude. His time writing gave him that solitude, and he hoped, he said, to extend it to his entire life. I have the idea of getting a house along the north coast and telling no one where I've gone. Even as I fantasize about this, I know it's a desperate move, but it's the only one I can think of as possible. Psychologically, if not socioeconomically, Michael had a family and developmental background shared by many gay men. His parents were wealthy, and his mother, who came from an even wealthier New England family, placed great value on social position. For her, a gay son was not part of the plan, and Michael had waited until he was 32 to come out to her. Michael described his mother as intensely asexual, and when he did come out to her, she said only, I don't want to hear any of the details. Michael had never seen affection expressed between his parents. His father had never been affectionate with him, and his mother was only affectionate in the most perfunctory ways she imagined a mother was supposed to be with a child. Michael thus led a familiar gay adolescence in which sex and emotionally constructed relationships were rigidly segregated from each other, leaving him feeling that a relationship with another man was a hopeless aspiration. Like planning your future around winning the lottery, he once told me. He was, of course, not forbidden socially constructed peer relationships with other boys, but the construction clearly excluded any romantic or sexual feelings. Michael had sporadically explored his sexuality, but the explorations were mostly one-time sexual encounters, and the sex was mostly not good at all. It was only with Paul that Michael had a relationship, a connection of friendship, companionship, romantic feelings, and sex. This was Michael's first and only emotionally constructed relationship. For both boys, it was distorted by the developmental influences of earlier adolescent experience. Another knew where to go with it at the time. Michael did not even think of himself as gay. And that, Paul wrote Michael, isn't going to work for me. Michael once summed up his year with Paul. We were like two orphans stranded in the wild. We had no idea where we were, who we were, or how to care for ourselves, much less each other. Even as Michael had had sporadic sex with other boys through his teenage years, he had no conscious gay self-identity, and the conscious identity would probably have left him even more hopeless about the prospect of relationships. At the age of 16, Michael began to focus on writing and thus initiated not only his creative life, but also his plan for a life in isolation. I remember being aware that I needed a way to have a life alone, even though I had no idea why it would have to be that way. As we continued our work together, Michael realized that he had lived as a teenager with a truly crushing sense of longing and loss for something he had never had, even as he did not know what that something was. I lived with a kind of gnawing or craving. It was just some kind of diffuse, very deep, painful desire that I've never really understood or resolved. These feelings were so familiar and pervasive that Michael had assumed that everyone privately held them. Michael said something else important. When I'm alone, I relish the solitude itself. It's something I have always lived with and now welcome. What bothers me is when it starts to feel like annihilation, as if I am ceasing to exist. I feel that a lot. 
human life exists substantially in companionship and intimacy with others. In some important sense, life without these connections does not subjectively feel like a complete existence. With all the hopeful gay social and political successes of recent years, there are still too many gay men who, like Michael, feel that life and love with another man is impossible. Lurking among the feelings that sustain such hopelessness is one that is often overlooked, self-doubt, which is largely an internalization of social influences, but takes root and develops a life of its own. The ongoing external prejudices of a stigmatizing society easily mesh with the internal feelings, and together they readily sustain a persistent self-doubt that propagates its own prediction. Michael doubted his viability in relationships. Paul's letter had confirmed that doubt, and two decades later, Michael still lived with it. In our work together, Michael and I would increasingly focus on his self-doubt, which, for all his external successes in life, remained profound. Much of the push for marriage equality has been motivated by the desire to overcome hopelessness about gay relationships, as well as the self-doubt that drives much of the hopelessness. But self-doubt is an internal problem and will never be fully resolved by political victories or the external approval that such victories hope to realize. Over time, probably decades, the legalization of gay marriage will likely shift the larger societies and gay men's acceptance of the fact of gay relationships. The question is whether this change will also shift acceptance of the actual nature of gay relationships, or if in marriage gay people will be expected, and expect themselves, to mimic the socially constructed idea of traditional heterosexual marriage. If legal marriage raises acceptance of gay relationships without compromising their emotional construction, this will be a truly important victory. If, instead, the acceptance is predicated on normalizing gay relationships by molding them, at least in appearance, into conventional heterosexual forms, the change will become a significant additional source of hopelessness for gay men. Mimicking and misrepresentation are inauthentic, and inauthentic lives feel hopeless. To be authentic, relationships between men must continue to express gay sensibilities, including the social, emotional, and sexual diversity that naturally characterizes relationships between men. The possibility of legal marriage raises the challenge of remaining oneself in an authentic and meaningful way. However, being oneself is understood by each man himself.